Can you guys hear me on the live stream? Give me some sort of response in the chat. Let's see. All right, that seems to be okay. I'm talking. Back is enough. All right. How's everybody doing the homework? Jeremy, I saw you got everything posted some hang-ups with rendering. We're going to talk about rendering first, I think. Katie, where are you at with this one? What's that? What's that? OK. Is, it, is Cinema 4D working on your machine at home? OK. Emily, where are you at with this one? OK. Is it just a matter of time, or is there some other problem? Well, what's the other problem, then? <laughs> What class is that? If I know the teacher, I'll give him a piece of my mind. Is it Jenna? OK. Well, let me give you guys a piece of advice for college. Learn the professor's name. That's a good one. What's my name? Casey is fine. Unless, I mean, I use the joke because my professors use the joke. It's like, Casey is fine. Unless something has gone horribly wrong, and then Dr. Farina is probably the best way to go. But really, Casey is fine. Sophia, where are you at? Yep, yeah. Uh, doing this kind of work is super time consuming. Oh, the TV's not even on. Let's give it a second to go. Here, this back over here. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hey. 
Mm. I couldn't get it to work. Very frustrating because it look of everything. Yes. And if I lift off, of course, that's. Okay, we're going to talk more about rendering first. Yeah. But, um,. Where is my... From last week. Go ahead. I created a little video for the... I can't... For this, try to that one. Numbers and in the... Figure it out, no matter. For the angles. The APV. Putting all these cameras. Working, it seems so silly. Guessing as far as like what direction it should curve. Well, how do you set up? Okay. Mm -hmm. You mean so just as far as like the hammer swinging back and forth? Anything, anything. For a try. Yeah, with the blocking, I mean, it's, um, I think one of the first things is making sure that Your timeline is, you know, within, you know, the you're in the right ballpark, right? And so, I mean, some of this may be hard for me to explain, right? Because I guess some of this timing stuff is kind of, I don't, I guess I don't think about it very much right, as far so as. You start yeah. With the yes. yeah. So the the timeline ballpark, right? So making sure that we're in the right thing. So I have this ball and I want it to go blip, blip, blip. Um, is, you know, you know, I think four seconds, you know, right around there, right? And if you're unsure about seconds, you know, the Mississippi thing is, is accurate. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, as far as getting you in the ballpark of actually getting at 60 BPM. And, um, Right, 60 beats per minute would be 24 frames per second, right? Just a click every second, essentially, right? Um, and so, okay, I know four, I need four seconds here, so I can do the math right here. Four times 24, and I got 96 frames in this case. Uh, you can make this, I usually leave it in frames, I don't know, just because it's there. You can change this. I'll look it up in a second. I usually don't do it. You can't change this to seconds, so it looks more like um, the After Effects one. Is that in the settings here? Control D. Mm -mm. It's somewhere. I'll look it up in a second. I'm not totally sure where that setting is. Um, but you can change the timeline, not, not the total amount of time, right? This would be the total amount of time over here, and it's also um, important to realize that the Cinema 4D, the work area, remember the work area where you set it with the beginning of um, B and the end keys, right? So you can get a tinier, tinier part. There's this thing right here, and this is the work area in Cinema 4D, right? By default, it should be the entire project. And so you, whether you want to see your entire timeline or just part of it. And you would do that for the same reasons that you would in After Effects, because you wanted to focus on part of the animation without having to look at the whole thing. Anyways, um, when I'm doing anything here, as far as the pendulum going back and forth or the ball, 
you know, I'm just roughing out the blocking here as far as knowing where, where I want it to be, when I want it to be. So P for position, or er, coordinates. Um, yeah, I'll do it with these. So I know I want to start here. And then, uh, yeah, I know I have four seconds here, and I want it to bounce, I don't know, let's say it's going to bounce three times. So, yeah, I'll move it. I know it needs to get here. And then I can keyframe. And like I said, I usually put a keyframe up the top. The when you're bouncing stuff, the important thing to realize is that if you start up, this first interval is half a bounce. So um, you can save yourself some time there. If this is half a bounce, right, uh, then the next keyframe should be roughly the same amount of time from here to here. If we're going to put in another keyframe at the top, right? Um, now, it, depending on the type of ball, right, that's the part of the, of the homework that was bowling ball versus ping pong ball. Not all the bounces will be the same amount of time, right? And so they will decrease a little bit. I know that and move it up a little bit again here. And then got to get back down there. All right, so that's about equal there. Sometimes in the other tutorials, you see me press this button. This button is keyframe all of the coordinates. All right, so watch what happens when I press this button. You see it gets, sets keyframes for all nine translation transform properties. Um, in this case, it, as you've realized, right, you're blocking things out. And then after we block things out, we're going to dive into the graph editor to tune the motion, right? And I want my life to be as simple as possible. So I don't want to set a whole bunch of unnecessary keyframes for things that don't change, right? Which is why I'm just using these buttons here instead of hitting uh, this button. Oh, thanks for the heads up, Logan. I'm just sending the wrong screen to them. There we go, Logan, let me know if that's better now. Should be the right screen, I think. Okay, so uh, down, 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 up. And uh, one more time. Up. Keyframe. I'm, all I'm doing is moving this. When I set the keyframes, just like in, this happens in After Effects too, like it, it shows you this line is the exact same as it is in After Effects, right? So this is, this is the keyframe. And then what are these tiny dots in between each one? The individual frames, right? And so based on the density of the dots along the line, we can yeah. infer speed. Does it show? Yeah, it shows in both views. I mean, um, you need to have the object selected. That's usually, right? Most of the th programs work that way so that you know, your screen doesn't have a million lines on it, you know, just showing you whatever it is that you're currently looking at. And uh, yeah, we'll say it like that. Cool, so that, I mean, that, that would be blocking process. And the default in Cinema 4D, I always get the default Cinema 4D, but you know, Bell posted that video about changing your default in Cinema 4D, and you should do that on your machine. That way, you don't have to deal with this every time. Um, so I'm getting the default interpolation, which is going to be spline, which doesn't look like a bounce right now. right? Nothing looks like it's bouncing because it's slowing down as it gets closer to the ground. 
And so we've got to come in to the F curve views. Another thing about Cinema 4D, if your stuff is not showing up here, you can drag from here to here in order to see that. Also under view, if you turn on automatic mode, that means that anything that's keyframed shows up down there. And so Cinema 4D is a little bit more uh, selective about what it shows you here. After Effects, you know, the bottom part, if you unfold, there's kind of everything. But um, let's look at uh, position Y. There we go. So now I need to do what we've done for all of these. There you go. In Cinema 4D, it's uh, shift you know, to break the handles. And so this isn't news to anyone, what I'm doing here, right? This is allows me to accelerate towards the ground and decelerate when I come back up. I only have one selected when I do that. I also do this draw to select a point. Instead of clicking on the point, I draw a square over the point. Because if you double click on points, especially in After Effects, you can throw it into a different mode, which um, is a little frustrating, maybe not great interface design. Anyways, it's kind of forced me to be in that habit, so I always do that instead of. Cool, that's not bad. Um, yeah, so the big picture here. You know, where, when. I suppose my default advice here is that uh, setting something up with sort of these equal timings uh, is a better is a better sort of default if you don't if you don't know if you don't have a if a plan going in right for the heavy ball I gave you that one fifth plan and so if you don't really if you're not totally sure setting something up with equal timings and then adjusting from there is usually easier than just shooting in the dark and then going back and trying to adjust stuff you know, so at least you have like okay this is all too fast or this is all too slow and then you can go from there and then go into the, remember in uh, After Effects, it's called the graph editor. Here it's F curves, same thing. And uh, tune the motion at that point. And so with the pendulums, you know, one of those, uh, I'd have to confirm that, but I think I believe that you know, for a perfectly phys physically accurate pendulum, the um, back and forth time stays the same because you're losing heat. Uh, you, you know, the reason you don't move as far is because your motion is translated into heat. I'm not a physics professor, but I believe that's correct. Anyways, so starting off with the pendulums, each swing taking the same amount of time, but just traveling less distance, right? That'll give you visual slowdown where they well then you can sort of tune there that's one of the the mistakes i see a lot of students make on the first pass of this is that the first swing goes and looks pretty good and then it goes fast back and forth and when it does that it looks weird because it looks like someone is either controlling it by controlling it adding energy into the system you know as opposed to just swinging but again we've talked about this before we're not always after the most physically uh, accurate uh, motion, right? We have this quality of motion is an artistic expression. It can be physically accurate or it can be super exaggerated or a whole world in between. Right? So, but having some idea of what the physically accurate stuff looks like 
uh, is good. And as, as far as like, even if you don't know, using some reference for that type of thing, um, yeah, this is where YouTube really shines as far as um, being a video of virtually anything. <laughs> Right, so you do the same thing if you're drawing a picture of any kind, right? Uh, you're, in this case, looking at uh, something that doesn't look animated, right? Because that means someone else animated it uh, versus, uh... oh yeah, so where were we? You know, my boy's in second grade, so we've gone to a lot of children's museums and they all kind of run together. Uh, there was one that had a really great pendulum machine, very similar to this. Anyways, you can sort of see, by just tying the bottom one, you know, these fr free swinging pendulums like this, they go on for a long, long time. There's a bunch of buildings that have, you know, those big pendulums in them that, uh, you know, it, go on for a very, very, very long time, especially the heavier it is with the longer string or whatever. But coming in here and using, you know, if you're going to draw someone's, if you're in life drawing class, you're looking at forms, right? This is the same process of uh, comparing what you're doing to what we observe, right? So having the motion reference is, is super powerful um, in that instance. You know, uh, those mallets, I was thinking of, uh, how do we spell croquet? I'm not even, E-T, yeah, that's the sport? Yep. I wonder if I can, uh, I'll have to look that up to see if I can. You know, as far as like, sense of weight, something hitting something. Obviously, this is not you know swinging by itself. Is this guy ever going to hit this ball? Let's see. Maybe not. Nope. Supposed to do it like that between your legs? I don't know. I don't really play this sport. So I can't, this is a necessary part of the process is reference, right? There's not always going to be a reference, but usually it's grounded in some sort of thing. What's going on here? Is this stationary? Is this like... Okay. Well, this is a problem. You start looking at YouTube videos, and you're like, what, what's happening? What's going on in this world? But, um, yeah. And so uh, in, even if you look for a bunch of people put this kind of thing, bouncing ball animation reference, there's a bunch of... All sorts of things there. Right, uh, in my character animation class, right, we're starting this where I'm having everybody film themselves doing the stuff and then, um, you know, using that as their reference. So there's a good one, ping pong ball. Seems to lose a lot. Maybe that's not a ping pong ball. That might have been a golf ball or something. Whatever that is. Anyways, you get the idea. So this would be, if you're totally lost, finding something to give you some kind of starting point would be a good idea. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Actually, do, do a, you know, the bat out and the ball out and hit it and just climb it yourself in some cases. Sure, sure, sure. In some cases, I just... Yeah. Anyway, the blur... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. It's a little uh, motion blur. After Effects has that button, which is super handy. However, that button only works uh, in certain uh, instances. Simo. Yeah, in Cinema 4D, it's a little more uh, complicated. And, and the reason the, it's complicated, and some of the stuff 
where it seems like I'm hiding complexity from you is that I'm trying to save you from something that allows me to pivot to. The other thing we're going to talk about is big, or let's say long, render time. Okay, so this is um, part of the process that a lot of most people are not familiar with coming into class, right? Even if you're a big Photoshop person, when you hit Control S on Photoshop or you go to make a Photoshop JPEG or whatever, it's you know, almost never going to be something that's going to be long, right? You, it may take a couple minutes for it to chugga chugga chugga. But here, we're doing that for all the frames. So if you don't know what you're doing, it's really, you, once you start learning a few things, it's very easy to end up with a huge render time, which um, requires an entire shift in mindset, right? Students sort of work at the last minute, and they're like, oh, I'll just save it and turn them in. And this is a huge part of uh, computer graphics as far as um, the amount of time it takes to output these things, especially if you're going for more sort of like um, you know, visually realistic uh, imagery, right? All that stuff takes a long time to render somewhat. So this class is not about um, everybody producing these super photorealistic images. And uh, I don't want you to not get, I, you need to spend more time animating and less time waiting for renders. And as such, I try to set things up so that you don't need to do so. But let's talk about the specifics of that here, right? And the two things here, the two things I would write down, the, the posing, uh, I, I talk about this a lot, things on a continuum. Right, where we're deciding to do something at one point on the continuum. And so this continuum here for rendering is real time. Real time meaning like I change something and I see that change reflected immediately. And the other end of the continuum would be offline rendering, where I hit render, it sends it off to something, and it eventually draws the picture for the frame. How long that takes? It could take a long time, right? Depending on the depending on the image. Did you guys see Gravity, that Sandra Bullock movie from a few years back, where she goes into space uh, and then has to get back down? Anyways, um, that's essentially like a, a computer animated film, right? She was not in space. Um, and, but it was made to look photorealistic. And in that case, uh, it's significant in that really like almost the entire film, like every shot is uh, computer generated in some way. There's a lot of films like that. But in this case, um, they're going for something very, very, very realistic. And uh, big studios confront this by having what's called a render farm, a whole bunch of computers sitting there doing nothing but rendering. So people work on their workstation, and then they send the file off to the render farm. And then the render farm takes the job, right? Your, let's say your scene is 700 frames. And it divides it up, saying, like, this computer renders 10 frames, this computer renders 10 frames, so that you can get it done faster. Right? How much faster? Well, it depends how big the render farm is and how fast the computers are and all that kind of thing. Right? If it took your computer one minute per frame, it would take it 700 minutes. But if you had 700 computers, it would take you one minute. Make sense? We don't have those kind of resources. Right? <laughs> now, there are sorts of render farms that you can use online where you send them your file and then they uh, send you the render back. Um, we're not going to use that. And so that's why I try to keep us uh, over on the real-time side of things so that you can see what you're doing while you're doing it and um, that makes it much easier to focus on the actual work rather than the render wrangling which can be a big part of it um, certainly so let's look at that in this instance all of the render Settings are going to be up here. I remember I'm in 24. Um, so this 
Remember, this is the slate. Did I talk about this in this class, the slate? This thing, right? Does anybody remember why it makes a sound? With the Synchronize with the audio, yeah, yeah. Some, that's not always necessary anymore, but um, you know, it's still the way it's done. Okay, so this box up here is super important um, because rendering is this whole thing. There is a separation that exists when you're working in these type of programs that does not exist in like After Effects and Photoshop, right? Photoshop for the most part does not have like a separate part of the program and it says like this is the rendering and then this is Photoshop. All of these types of 3D programs, right? And we're using Cinema 4D, but the other ones you should at least be aware of, right? Blender is another one you'll see people talk a lot about online. Uh, Maya is another one, um, 3ds Max, Houdini, right? These are all programs that do the same kind of stuff that Cinema 4D does, right? Where you're doing stuff in 3D and placing objects and manipulating them, animating them, so on and so forth. Um, and in Cinema 4D, you do, you do the work, and then you pass it off to something to render the job, right? And at this point, there are different options that don't exist in programs like Photoshop or even really in After Effects to the same extent. Uh, like, how do you want to render this? Why, why is this, there this extra level of complication? Because there's different ways to leverage your technology, right? So the reason I made it such a big deal at the beginning of the semester about everyone getting the right computer is because of this last part here. Um, before, when we drew all of the renders, it had to be done on your CPU, right? Which is the main brain of your computer. The CPU, um, a modern CPU has multiple cores in it, right? So that meaning that each tiny part does, it, does jobs. But as far as how many cores, you know, maybe if you've got like a screaming computer, it's like 24 or so, but usually like maybe 12 or 6. And they can each sort of work on the frame together. Um, but in general, this is okay, but kind of, um, you know, not too fast. The newer technology is rendering stuff on the GPU, your graphics processing unit, right? And there's different ways to do this, but if you set it up correctly, you can actually render sort of in real time, meaning that you don't even need to, this doesn't need to be a separate step. Like you're, as you're working, you're seeing things happen. And so this is, there's two options here in Cinema 4D, but one of them is the viewport render, which is what I've been setting these programs up to do for you here at the beginning, meaning that we're going to make Cinema 4D make the viewport look like the render, and then it just outputs the viewport using the GPU. This is fast. Why is the GPU faster? Because uh, it has many cores, and the cores on a GPU are slightly different. Um, and by many cores, you know, your CPU has something in the order of like 6 to 50, you know, cores. Your GPU has somewhere between, you know, I don't know, 1200 to like 5000 um, in there because it's set up for this very specific type of like parallel processing. It's very fast for certain things. One of the things it's super fast at is drawing things on the screen because that's what it's designed to do. People have since leveraged this to do all sorts of other stuff like artificial intelligence and machine learning and that kind of thing because this is a huge speed up, right? Just looking at those numbers, 5,000 is way more than 50, right? Like way more, an order of magnitude, as a matter of fact. So um, that's why this is a big deal. Eventually, you know, this will kind of be the way that everything defaults, hopefully in like maybe a year and a half or two years, so that I don't need to spend quite as much time explaining all this. 
uh, so that this is sort of the built-in standard and you can sort of just invisibly engage in it. But right now, we are like in a transitionary period between these two technologies. Before, everyone always used this instead of uh, using this. But right now, we're sort of in a period where things are transitioning, kind of, between one and the other. Because this has been leveraged a whole bunch. You need to use this type of rendering in video games, right? Video games, you can't do offline rendering because when you hit the button, Mario needs to jump. You can't hit the button and then wait for it to draw Mario and then have Mario. Like, obviously, it doesn't work, right? Um, OK, so now that that's being said, let's look at the options up here. And let's discuss these. Viewport render. This is the one. This is our preferred renderer. Okay, so this means that it's just going to draw whatever you see in the viewport. And by making the viewport look nice, we can get a, a pretty good render that is very fast. Yeah, getting all the wrong buttons. Is it this one here? Standard. So this is the default. And this one goes on the CPU. So this could take a while to render. And I think some people have made new files or maybe didn't use the template. And then this would be the case, right? So in this, let's get to that in a second. These other ones here um, are different flavors of the same thing that we're not going to get into too many specifics on. This is another CPU-based render that, you know, in some instances might make it might make a um, more physically accurate image. However, at at great cost, it could take way longer. Right, the, that's the problem. Is that very easily you can get a, into a situation where it's not like it's going to take another two minutes to render. It could take another three hours to render, right? Because you flicked a box or checked a checkbox or did a different drop down and didn't realize that it was a thing. Which is why I try to eliminate this stuff from your purview. Here. Uh, Redshift is another GPU renderer, right? So it could be fast. However, it is also complicated. Um, prohibitively so, especially for this 184 class. And that uh, not super user friendly. Okay, so. Our options here are standard and viewport. That's where we're going to spend our time this semester. Does that make sense for everybody? OK. Let's, let's talk about the differences here. All right. Uh, in order to, to really examine the differences here, we need to get some stuff happening. And so I'll do another studio setup like we did before real quick. All right, so we use the studio backdrop. That's a good one here in Content Browser. As soon as you start grabbing everything from anything from the Content Browser, what is it that you need to remember when you're saving your files? Save. Everyone have this written down and starred with assets. So that otherwise, uh, you're going to run into uh, black textures. Right? So Cinema 4D can't find a specific texture that it's looking for. It just makes the object like a hundred percent black. It kind of looks like a void, right? It doesn't have any reflections or anything. It's just like a black hole, right? So that's that. When you see black textures, that's 
what Cinema 4D is communicating to you, unless you've intentionally made it that way. In After Effects, remember we got the color bars? You know, where, where they couldn't find, uh, let's just write AE. Right, that's Cinema 4D's feedback is just total blackness. AE, it's the color bars when it can't find an asset. In Unity, in 200, it makes it pink. You can't find, uh, when you can't find it, something. Save. Does it automatically save? Nope. No. 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 That's that's a totally different uh, thing. Increment and save is is uh, versioning. Saving with assets is selecting your files. Right. So they're two two separate concepts. Um. Everybody, everybody, have this one. You guys understand what I'm saying here? Cool. All right, because this is a key one. All right, so let's bring this in. And uh, pop, pop, pop. there we go. This needs to be bigger. So uh, in the content browser assets, uh, the ones that have adjustable things usually have a separate tab here. And you can select it. And you know the adjustable, because these are things that someone um, has kind of like programmed. Uh, in that they've made them, you know, like configurable objects. So you can come in here, and they're usually, you know, as long as you're not grabbing like a, one of the characters or something, which is substantially more complicated. The other things here have controls which should be self-explanatory, right? Height, depth, width, curvature. These things should be fairly obvious. And um, there we go. Of course, they're good. And let's uh, bring in some lights. So uh, we'll just grab the target light, right? That's our studio light that I recommend for everybody. And you see that uh, we need to move this a little bit. Let me say a word about this. Is that, uh, okay, the, I want to drag this light straight up. But you see, I, it's hard to do that because this arrow is not pointing straight up. Right? It's pointing sort of off to the side. Um, and if we look at it a little bit closer, we see that what, uh, which axis is, the, axis is this, the blue one? Z. A few things to learn here. Z is forward. Okay. Especially for things in, you know, like what we think of as, as con conventional 3D space. Conventional meaning like there's a floor, there's a ceiling, you know, like how we normally experience 3D space, right? Up and down is Y. And then XZ is across the floor, right? And, you know, what, what is forward, right? I, you know, I could be moving. Forward is, is sort of relative, right? It's probably the direction my head is facing, but as far as like the general direction of the room, right, what, what's forward here. Um, Z is always forward, right? So if you're making a 3D object that has some sort of directionality, it should be pointed in the Z direction, right? So if you get a car or you make a car, the car should be pointed in the Z direction. Okay? Now, the, the program's not going to object if you do something else. It's more of the convention. That's what people expect, is that Z is forward. And if we, we see that that's the case with the light. See how the light is pointed at the target? The Z axis is pointed at the target. Everybody with me there? OK. And so what's going on right now is that this axis is in object space. This is a really important concept to rock here. The axis of the. Let's just do this again. Hold on, stream issue here. Moving? I am. I do something here.
There we go. Logan, can you let me know if the uh, stream looks okay for you? Yeah. Okay. The important part I'm making. There's two things to know about here, object space and world space. How is the axis oriented? Right now, this light is oriented in object space, and that Z is pointed forward. Um, and it's hard to make it go straight up, because straight up is a world space orientation. How do I switch between these two things? Right here. So this is the toggle, space toggle here. And see how it has the axis and like a cube? This means object space. If I press the button, watch, watch two things. The icon changes to now like a globe and an axis. And the axis itself has changed. And so now it's oriented itself towards the world. The position of the light has not changed, right? It's still exactly where it was. It's just now my ability to interact with it is based in world space, not object space. One of these is not better than the other. You just need to understand you, it's a switch, switch you can flip and under which circumstances you need to flip it. Why am I changing it to world space in this case? Because it makes it much easier to sort of position the light in world space than it does when it's uh, in object space in this case, right? I can drag it straight up and over. Makes it very easy to position. All right, so again, I'll switch it back. See how the light itself does not move. It's just the axis that is reorienting itself. Right, another instance might be um, you know, here's a thing. It has some sort of weird orientation, kind of like that. Okay, let's say that this is a uh, spaceship. Okay, and so this the spaceship here is in some sort of you know I just sort of just sort of randomly rotated it, kind of in a strange space. And so in this case, if I wanted this spaceship to fly forward, I would want to be in object space, right? Because then I could move it along the axis and it goes in the direction it's pointing. Does that make sense? Uh, versus world space, where if the axis is oriented like this, it would be very difficult to make it move in, in this direction, the direction that it's pointing. All right, so another instance here where just knowing which one you're in and which one you want to be in is the, the key there. We'll come across this all semester long, but uh, it's important to sort of understand the fundamental there, object space versus world space. And this is not a Cinema 4D thing. This will, you know, every, this is a deal in every program, like object space versus world space. Cool. All right. And so now uh, let's go ahead and make another light. I'm going to go back to world space. I'm going to control drag this one over. And so I have two lights. And my default studio thing is I make one light maybe a little dimmer than the other because, again, you know, in order to make something, an image more interesting, we don't want every parameter to be the same. And then the big thing in 3D that students forget, write this down, turn on shadows. Okay, This doesn't necessarily make it more realistic, but you almost always want to have shadows. It makes it very hard to understand the placement of objects in three dimensions without shadowing. And this is one of the things I, I get most often, is students turning in stuff, there's no shadows, and it just looks not great. You know, it looks, um, it looks old, right? Because, again, a lot of the simplified computer graphic stuff looks retro because we, the computing power to do this stuff wasn't always there. I mean, now we can do shadows, no problem. And so, yeah. Put the shadow, the shadow. No. Because like the word time.
Okay, well, th there's a couple issues there. So the, the shadows are enabled per light. Okay, so it's whether you want shadows from this light or that light. So you can, this allows you to do a bunch of cool stuff that you can't do in real life, right? You can't like add a light that doesn't cast shadows in, in real life, right? That's not, that's not on the table. Here, yeah, you can turn this on and off granularly, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, but in our case, if you have a light, a good rule here for your first few months would be, yeah, it should have shadows on um, and, until you're a little bit more familiar with it. Now, why are we not seeing them? We're not seeing them because we haven't, uh, unfortunately, the, view, the default here is not set up um, to see them. And so let's do that. We did this last week, but let's do it again. Shift V gives us the viewport settings, right? And we're going to use, like I said, our preferred thing is going to be the viewport renderer, which is essentially going to render what we see, which is great because of all the aforementioned reasons. And Shift V is the viewport settings. And so if you make it look good in the viewport, your render will look good. This is why I you teach this at the beginning because it's this direct correlation. Again, we're getting to that WYSIWYG setup. And so let's go to effects and turn on the stuff that we want. We want uh, some uh, shadows. There we go. That immediately looks like 100% better. This is this, right? This has a sense of space now. The shadow is incredibly important to understanding, like, where is this ball, right? And in this instance right now, it's like, is that ball glued to the back wall? Maybe. I don't know. It's hard to say, right? Um, when you turn on shadowing, it's like, oh, now I can really understand where things are in space. Does that make sense for everybody? Cool. Uh, the other thing we want to turn on, yeah, anybody? Feel free to reference your notes. What does SSAOS stand for? Yes, ambient occlusion. And this is the shot. What's that? So I'm going to turn it on. I don't think we're going to see much. Right. We don't see much in this frame. But I'm going to go fast forward to one where the ball is kind of on the ground. Now, off, very subtle there. Yeah, yeah, so, and uh, shift V, get this back. There's some uh, settings here. So if you unfurl each of these carrots, there's some stuff. Mm, don't, don't, uh, I would stay away from adjusting these things, but one of the simple ones here is a power, sort of how dark it is. If I dial it up and down, see here. Light or something, there we go. See it. There we can see it a little bit. OK? So that's the other part here that um, may seem unnecessarily frustrating, but it just kind of is the way it is, is that um, rendering, I, I said render settings. That's where everything is set, right? However. It's all a system, right? And that system, I would say, consists of the lights and the settings and the materials. So all of these things work together, which is why, like, if your stuff shows up black or you don't see the shadow, the first thing I'm going to tell you, like, is, well, make sure you have, you know, shadows checked in the lights. However, there's some other issues in the system that may be preventing the you from seeing the shadows right for instance if the floor is super bright 
then even though there are shadows enabled and a shadow is falling onto the floor, you may not be seeing it because it's being washed out by the brightness of the floor. Um, there's a bunch of things here, which makes dealing with this sometimes a little bit more difficult in that getting the image you want is a balance between this, this, and this. So all of these things work together. Yes, Sophia? Green space ambient. Okay, screen space, let's break that down, right? Um, screen space is a faster way to calculate visual stuff where it's sort of based on the pixels, right? As opposed to calculating it in the 3D space of the world, right? In our instance, screen space is almost always a lesser calculation because there's way less pixels than there are 3D points in the world that you're working in, right? So screen space, just a way of meaning faster. Ambient, meaning the ambient light. So not the light that's coming from one of your light sources, right? In the real world, the ambient light is the result of, you know, the light comes out of our light here, it hits the floor, it bounces off the wall, it goes across the room, bounces off, right? It does this, you know, an infinite amount of times, and after a certain point, you know, every time it bounces off something, it loses energy, and you end up with this, this very low level of ambient light, where this is very low level thing. This ambient light is usually a separate entity in the computer, because doing this calculation of where light is bouncing, if, if we want, you can't do an infinite number of bounces. The computer can't calculate infinite number of things. It would take a long time. So, uh, you know, when it loses energy, you usually have like a cutoff, saying like, oh no, st this one is now just for our purposes off, right? Anyways, ambient. Occlusion. What does the word occlusion mean? It means to block. Yeah, so it's blocking the ambient light. Another word that doesn't necessarily mean exactly the same thing, but I think helps people um, categorize it, is contact shadow, right? And so it's the shadowing that appears when something is usually on top of something else, right? Usually it's stuff sitting on a table, stuff sitting on the floor. Does that help you remember it there? Screen space, ambient, occlusion, right? So we're blocking light. So these, these are not your main shadows, right? Not the shadow you're casting on the ground from the sun. It's the tiny bit of darkening that happens when one object sits on another object. And in general, it always looks better to have this on than off under most of Right, so this ambient occlusion here wasn't super visible until I you know, took the material off the studio backdrop just as a demonstration there because this is a bright material and my light is turned up very brightly. Um, so again, an example of those things sort of working together. Uh, let's see here. If something in my project was transparent, I would want to have that on. That's not going to make a difference right now. Um, is there anything else we want to make sure we turn on? Reflections are on. Fault. And the other part of our studio backdrop is our reflections, right? And so this is... Um, if I bring in something that's shiny, right? So uh, one of the nice looking materials here is there's a bunch of uh, car paint. You know, car painting cars is a very complex painting process. There's this layering that happens, but it, you know, there's always this, usually this gloss on the high uh, end of it. Anyways, now let's grab this sweet looking car paint, bring that in, put that on our ball. There we go. And so now the ball looks super glossy, right? Very shiny. But this is the reflection issue. Uh, if we look at it, we're like, what? Like it looks shiny, but upon first glance, which is good, but upon second glance, it's like, 
what, what are we, what are, what's in the reflections here, right? So sometimes it's not an issue, like what's in the reflections, because, you know, with an object that looks more matte or dull, you, you, you can tell there's being light reflected, but, you know, you can't see what it is. But as you get closer to a mirror, what you're seeing in the reflection becomes more of an issue, right? Um, like, if you have a scene, and like a mirror in your scene is reflecting some other scene, that you want to be able to control that, right? Like, maybe you want to do that on purpose, but often not. You want it to look like an actual mirror that's reflecting the right stuff. So, um, the default here, again, is like this forest, uh, or like just like a park or something. Um, you can see some buildings or something, right? And yeah, in this instance, like that's kind of weird because this is clearly in a studio. And so this is where, uh, in order to do this, like well, first of all, reflections. This is another area where why don't we just have real reflections, right? Why, does, why doesn't it just reflect the stuff that's in the scene? That would seem to be like the most obvious thing. Why not? Because that is expensive, right? Again, in two years maybe, that'll be the default, and I, I'll stop having to talk about this. Um, the word, the term that you may, especially if you're familiar with video games, you've heard this before, ray tracing, right? I'll brag, I have a PS5, right? The thing about the PS5 is that it's got you know ray tracing built into the hardware to some extent, right? So I get all these really cool looking reflections when I'm playing Spider-Man, it's awesome, right? I walk up to a window and Spider-Man sees himself in the window and it's like real time, pretty cool. Um, but like I said, this is expensive for the reasons that I talked about before, right? This, this is the photon bouncing around the room, computationally expensive, right? When I say expensive, that's what I mean. It takes a lot of computing cycles. Now, often, that also means it takes a lot of cash to buy the thing that's going to do a lot of computing, but not always. Anyways, um, so this is expensive. How did, well, OK, if that's the case, how did we see any reflections prior to this? Is that we have fake reflections, right? And so um, this is a, a reflection map where we take an image of the world and we sort of wrap it around the object. That's what's happening right here. We've got this image. In this case, the image doesn't line up with our space. Um, and we wrap it around this object. And it, it does look shinier, but uh, it's a little nonsensical in this case. And so the reflections that we're going to use, one of the things that we have to give up here using the viewport render is that we're not going to get these super fancy reflections. We're going to use the fake reflections, but that'll be just fine. In order to use the fake reflections, we need to provide a sky, right? The sky is going to be the way that Cinema 4D, by putting something in the sky, the object that wraps around everything, it allows us to see, uh, to control what we're seeing in the reflections. Does that make sense? We want to, you know, this is where we provide the reflection. So I will make a sky that's up here. Or if I didn't know where it was, I can shift C sky. There it is. Uh, a word of warning here, shift C sky. There is something called physical sky. Uh, don't use that. Okay. Just regular sky for now. Um, physical sky, a different object, just a lot more complicated stuff. Anyways, sky is what we want. When I did that, uh, cool. All right, so you see it did something immediately. But now my ball looks like you know, not shiny. It's still just as shiny, right? The material is set to reflect just as much as it was before. But what is it reflecting now? I made a sky, and so now my entire scene is surrounded by like an infinite gray void. That's the default 
you know, appearance of the sky, just like all of these objects, right? When you make any new primitive, it doesn't have a material, and so the default look is just like gray. So we, how do we change that when we have an object? How do we make this yellow? What did I put on this ball? What's it called? This thing. That's right, material. Right, right. And so we need to put a material on the sky so that there's something around our scene that um, in, we're not going to directly see it. We're going to see it in the reflection. So over here, I can come back and look for studio again. And here I need to look at exactly what I want. And the nice thing is that this is set up that it does give you categories of what it's showing you here. So these are C40 objects. OK, I don't want an object. These are images. I don't want an image. These are materials. That's what I want, right? And so these can be applied to um, my sky. So let's look. Let's try them. Uh, you see that there's three different, you know, sort of photo studio materials here. We'll see how they look. I'll drag this one over. Cool. Now I see something that looks like studio lights reflected in my material there. Uh, some of the lighting has changed slightly on the background because the background is also reflective, just not as reflective as the ball. Let's see what this one looks like. Drag it over. The first one. This just might take a second to update. There it goes. All right, so this is a different material setup. You see that this one has a very hot floor and ceiling. And another thing to write down about the sky. So what, what should you do when you have a sky? Put a material on it, right, so that it reflects something. And number two, you can rotate it to control what exactly you're seeing in the reflections. You cannot move it. It's like this infinitely large thing that surrounds your scene. Moving it doesn't matter. There's a bunch of things like this in 3D, where it's like a like the force. It surrounds us, right? Uh, and moving it doesn't really make sense. Here, we can change its orientation. I don't even, I don't know if it, if I hit E, yeah, it lets me move it, but it doesn't do anything, right? I hit R, now I can rotate the orientation of this. And you can see how it affects the lighting and the reflections. Let's grab one more. Let's try this really bright one. Let's bring this one over. And yeah, you see how it does take a second to update here. I like switch them out. There we go. Then it did it. Why does it take a second? Because it's sending it, it's sending this image to the GPU. Right? Because the reason all this is happening so fast is because it's getting processed on the GPU. Like 5,000 cores executing all this stuff in real time. However, that, that's one of the, um, as you read more about computer graphics or computers in general, you hear about bottlenecks. What's a bottleneck? Or if you pay attention to traffic at all, what's a bottleneck? Yeah, too much stuff. You got to jam it through a small area, right? The computer has a bunch of these uh, bottlenecks. One of them is sending information from the CPU to the GPU that um, I can't speak to the specifics of it, but you know there's a, there's only so much bandwidth and at such a speed that that can happen, and it's usually less than sort of the maximum operating of both of them. So that's one of those issues there is that it's, it says like okay you want to switch that out, let me send that whole image over to the GPU, and then once it gets there, then you're good to go because it's sitting in GPU memory. And now I can rotate it around, and it'll do all of this in real time. And I can, you can see it's like totally responsive. 
because now this image is sitting in GPU memory. It can access that super fast, and uh, it's good to go. But that initial process takes a second. And it may be longer if your you know, computer isn't quite as uh, you know, ready to go, as new, essentially. Sound good? Now, eliminate the other layers of material while trying to render. Uh, no, it doesn't do that. That kind of thing, it's where like Photoshop thing, just you know, you'll still it's work on it. See in the files, open it, you know, bytes and megabytes. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So it, that, as far as like the file size, yeah. Like when I hit save with assets now, because all three of these materials are in the project, right. it'll save all three of these assets. In our case, for this entire class, that's not going to be like a prohibitive amount of data, right? You know, like a couple megabytes or something. But, but no, only, only storage, not render time. The 3D programs uh, are generally um, designed to be more efficient than Photoshop in that way, because you know Photoshop doesn't really have like the real time mode or whatever. But I, I don't know exactly how Photoshop processes stuff. But here, they've all been designed to try to be as efficient as possible. And so when you have multiple materials, if one's covering up another one, that's generally not going to increase render time. Also, there's something called calling. Right, and so there's all of this behind the scenes processing happening where stuff, what do we want to render? The stuff that we're going to put in our movie, right? We don't want to waste a bunch of time rendering all this other junk that's not going to be in our, in our movie. And so that's what it's called calling. It, it, it you know, says like, okay, what's on screen? I'm just going to calculate that stuff. I'm not going to waste time doing all this other stuff. So most of the time that, that is the case. Now. For your own organization, unless you're doing it on purpose, I would not put a whole bunch of materials over here. Now remember, these evaluate in this direction. And so if I put another car paint on here, it'll cover up the previous car paint. Right? Now, and I, I don't believe that's increasing render time, it's just ignoring the other one. Right? But just for the sake of like working clean, you know, I would get rid of that so I know what's going on here. For whatever reason, the green one doesn't seem to work. Like I said, not all the materials are directly designed to work 100% with the uh, viewport. But you know, in the next, probably in 25, it's cleaner. 24 was the first uh, Cinema 4D with the new asset browser. So they were reformatting a lot of stuff. Anyways, making sense so far? OK. So now uh, we've got something that looks good. We came over to Shift V. We've got everything set up. This looks nice. We need to come up here. So we, we what is the big workflow here? One, make viewport look good. Why are we doing that? Because that's what we're going to output. Number two, render viewport. There's a few things to keep in mind here is that we need to, if you're using a blank document, you need to say you want to use the viewport renderer because that's not the default. Now again, once you change the default on your home machines, it'll stick. At school, you know, because I don't have, anyways, it doesn't work at school, on the lab computers. The school computers you checked out from school, it will stick. Okay. Uh, we need to say the viewport renderer. And we need to say that we want to make the same adjustments, meaning that the stuff that we did to make the viewport look good, we want to adopt all of that same, all those same adjustments. Okay, so we did step number one, like viewport looks okay, 
I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, if I wanted to change the color of the studio backdrop, I don't think there, if I click on backdrop, studio backdrop, yeah, there's no color here, so it's in the material. If I double click on the material, um, if I double click on the material, we have our different, remember, this is the material, these are the channels. Notice that there is no color. That's weird. Again, we're kind of in a transition here. If, if it's not checked, and you bring it in from the asset, press, as, uh, asset browser, uh, in general, don't check it. <laughs> right, so if it's not on here, that's a reason. If I come to reflectance, I can see that there are some things here. Now there's a color I could adjust to, let's see. Or the yeah. Add Gives you the color. Or yeah. This, then, yeah. Then it makes color. Yep. Um, yeah. Again, the reason this seems obtuse is it's a transitionary period from, you know, the color was sort of the old technology. Now all of the reflectance based PBR. So you'll hear that word again and again PBR not PAPS Blue Ribbon, is physically based, physically based rendering. Meaning that we want to try and render things like they would appear in the real world. Everybody has a lot of experience in the real world. If this just functioned like that, that would be easier, right? It's obviously the, you know, uh, least amount of friction. There. However, this wasn't always possible, so we're kind of in a transition state. Okay, so let's come up here. So now, before I render, I need to come over here. Like I said, number one, we've made everything look good. Number two, now we need to make sure that this is what we get when we render. And so up here, what do I need to change this to? Right, viewport render. There we go. We see that all of a sudden a bunch of options have disappeared. That's always a good sign. Like, oh yes, my life has become less complicated now just by making that one decision. Cool. Good. Um, first thing, let's come over here to output. How do these settings look? Yep. So up here, uh, we can actually select uh, film video. 1080.24, and that should do a couple things for us. That changes this, and also change this. So this is um, let's let's um, alert. This is uh, something that gets people, and some of you ran into this with the first project. In After Effects, when we change the frame rate, then you're good to go, right? Uh, the uh, the 24 frames per second is what you render. In Center 4D, there's two FPS to set. You have your project and then the render. This can cause problems in that you have your project running at one frame rate, but then you rendered another frame rate, and you end up with a different amount of frames than you thought you did. And so in, we're, we're never going to do that. We want all those numbers to be the same. The other one that gets students here is this one, frame range. By default, it's set to just render one frame. In our case, if we just say all frames, that's usually what we want. We've, we've, at that very first step when I was blocking stuff out, I made this, you know, the length of my scene. So you can manually adjust this. Like if you have something that's longer and you just want to render out one part of it, you can do all that. Okay, so now this looks pretty good. 1920 by 1080, 24 frames per second, all frames. Good to go. Let's come down here to viewport, or let's go in order. Let's go to save. So now in the save dialog box, a couple important things here. What kind of thing do we want to make? 
That's right, PNG sequence, right? It's an image sequence. Like I said, it's just a pile of pictures, one picture for each frame. It could be any kind of picture. You could make a pile of JPEGs, you could make a tile of, pile of TIFFs, but our, our one that's gonna work here is PNG, and so we don't wanna say TIFF, we wanna say PNG. And every semester, some clever students look down here and they're like, wait a minute, what is this guy doing? I can just make a movie right now. I don't need to take this to After Effects and waste my time like a chump. I could just do it right here. You could, you could do it. Why not do that? Be uh, two reasons. Number one is that all of our workflow is that we're bringing things into AE for color correction and you know adding titles, all of this general compositing, right? And that's how the work is done. You can't really do that stuff in Cinema 4D in the same way. Does that make sense? Number two is when you render. Uh, if you render a movie and there's a failure, meaning that the computer shuts down or your battery runs out, while you're rendering, you lose the entire render. That file gets corrupted and you can't play it. If you're making a PNG sequence, you can come in and pick up where you left off because they are all discrete files, right? I'm rendering 90 frames, I'm on frame 45, the power goes out in my house, the next day I get power back, I can just go back in and start at frame 46 and I'm good to go. Whereas if I was rendering a movie file, I'd have to say like, all right, let's start all over. It's not that big a deal because at the beginning, because our render times are not huge by design. However, later on, this could become a very big deal where you know, now I've got to start over with the whole thing because I put all my eggs in one basket. Right, so we want to say PNG. Uh, sometimes students accidentally click this dialog box right here. You want this to be this, this is the naming format, meaning that it's gonna be whatever you name the file, the frame number, and then the um, extension. So it still says TIFF, but it's gonna be a PNG, right? It's just because they use TIFF in the uh, convention here, right? There's different formats, right? Sometimes students check this or just select something else. And then you make a bunch of files that don't have a file extension on them. And they're still the right kind of file. It just makes it harder to use because your computer doesn't recognize them, so on and so forth. Cool. And uh, we'll call this uh, test bounce. There we go. And um, this one is key. Right here, alpha channel. Is there transparency? Right now, the whole image is contained in what our camera sees, right? Um, there's a background, there's a ball, and so we're not gonna be compositing this against another background in After Effects. However, later in the semester, we'll definitely do that, where it'll be like, most a two, mostly a 2D thing, but then we wanna have a 3D rotating cube, right? Well, doing the 3D rotating cube in Cinema 4D is about five seconds of work. In After Effects, it would be, take some doing. Right, And so it would be much better just to do that over here and then bring it into After Effects. But when you bring it into After Effects, you're gonna wanna have the background so we can just layer it on top and see whatever is behind it in After Effects. In which case you would check this box, the Alpha Channel. This is important to understand, right? The, um, we're, we're using PNG all semester long because they're, the format does, allows for, an app, um, so we'll say allows for alpha channel. That means it could have an alpha channel, it doesn't always have an alpha channel. 
whereas something like a JPEG does not have an alpha channel. It's not part of the format. Cool. OK, that looks good for now. And then down here, viewport render. So recognize all this stuff. Where did we see this stuff before? When we were adjusting the viewport settings, right? These are the exact same things. Um, if I hit Shift V, go to effects. There we go. See here? The same as here. Notice that? So if I were to render this now, let me do that as a test uh, by pressing this button. What, did I, what am I not getting in my render? Yeah, yeah, that's the obvious one in this instance, right? Um, because shadows are not checked in this list. However, uh, you know, copying this would do the job. They've provided this button for you, which is super, because in most instances, they realize that like, you're going to want your render to look like what you did in the viewport. And so you can just say, yeah, I want it to be exactly the same as what I did in the viewport. So now let's do a test render. This window right here that pops up when you render, this is called the picture viewer. That's the Cinema 4D name for this window. That can be confusing. Sometimes this window can get kind of lost. Uh, you know, window, if you look up here, yeah, it's right here, the picture viewer window. So now if I render, looks good. We're getting the shadows. However, in terms of output, what if in a perfect world, what would you want to take out of this image? Well, because we're rendering, it's called the viewport render, and we're rendering the stuff that's in the viewport, the thing that's getting rendered by default is this stuff, the controls, the interface, all of those kind of things, right? Which um, usually we would not want in our render, right? We, we don't want to have the axis show up in the render itself. So we have one more setting to take care of here. If we come over here to filter, there we go. Here's all the stuff that gets rendered. There's this really great button. Again, they sort of forecasted this. There was just like, just show me the stuff, not all the controls. And so we can say geometry only. So now, let's do it one more time. Wonderful. We're not getting any of the controls. We're getting shadows. We're getting our fake reflections. In general, this looks OK. We're getting our screen space ambient occlusion. And we're not getting any of the, 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 second, the second one here under oh, ge geometry only. The white dots. That, oh, yeah, the, um, that, you know. um, I think that might be like a thing. They may, they may have fixed that in 25, um, where they still showed up and they went away if I just, de the text was still selected. If I just clicked off of it and just selected anything else, then they didn't show up. That's a kerning control for the typography. Oh, Yeah, it, it, that 
that control is like a newer addition to the program, and so for some reason, I'm sure that that'll be fixed probably. It, I, yeah, I'm, it may already be fixed in 25. I can't know for sure, but yeah, if you do get those dots, just you know, like right now I have Studio Backdrop selected, right? Just click so nothing is selected, and then they they, they won't show up. Okay, so let's re review slash bring this information together. So I selected uh, HDTV 1080.24, right? All these are in the render settings checkbox. That gave me everything else I wanted. I also wanted to make sure I said all frames so that I render my entire project. In the save, I made sure I said uh, PNG, so that I was getting a PNG image sequence. And then in the viewport, I said that I wanted to, I pressed that copy viewport settings. Now, that works because we did step one. What was step one? Make the viewport look good, right? If I didn't do that and I said copy the viewport settings, it would still look like not great because I didn't, you're, you're copying bad stuff. Uh, and then I also uh, went over to filter and I checked the geometry only. Yes. I mean, for the, uh, I did. I mean, we're just not seeing it because there's no transparent stuff in the scene, right? So if I, uh, if I made something else, yeah. I mean, th it's not in this. In this case, it's not. Um, in in case I do put something in there that's see through, you know, I know that that that's checked. Right. So, for instance, if I came in here and uh, well, if we go grabbed uh, some sort of see through thing. Let's look for glass. Now, the glass part of what makes glass look like glass is one the see throughness, two the reflections. Okay, and the reflections in glass are even more complicated because there's this, you know, it goes through the glass, and then you're seeing the reflection on the other side of the thing. There's a bunch of stuff there, right? All of that complex light interaction, if you want that to look really, really accurate, that's all in the ray tracing world, right? And so you're not going to get a bunch of the super complicated looking things. But um, let's just grab some sort of standard glass. Right. And so we get, you know, a facsimile thereof. If I... Um, uh, let's look and see what that looks like if I turn this off. Yeah, so it's sort of taking into account uh, some of what's... Another issue here, these spheres don't look particularly round. Everybody see that? They look kind of um, like they're made of polygons. Um, big thing you need to write down Jeez. All right, here we go. Let's try this again. Uh, 
Polygons cannot be bent. Okay? We only create the illusion of curvature by subdividing. Meaning we create more polygons that are themselves straight. Turn them just a little bit each time. So we create this, uh, this illusion of a smooth, smooth surface. And so to make these spheres look better, right here we have segments. This is how many polygons are being used to draw this sphere. Press MB. And if I dial this up, you can see that our sphere looks way better. Yes. It's an option for the sphere. And so subdivision, the amount of sub polygons being used for an object is going to be a parameter of that object. Okay? And so I just clicked on sphere in the object tab. And then there's different parameters here, but segments for a primitive, it'll be segments, meaning like how many polygons are being used to do this. Segments. There you go. For other objects, you'll see something that says subdivisions, where it smooths things out. Did you use the floor object or did you use a plane? Did you use the floor object or did you use a plane? Good okay, you, you, you want to use a plane. Okay, I'll, I'll, you'll see me sometimes like change the name of it to floor, yeah. but there's a separate object named floor. That object has a bunch of problems because it's like the sky. It's like an infinitely large okay. plane. And so the UV coordinates no. Yeah, it doesn't calculate because it's this, this infinitely large um, thing. So just stay, plane. use plane, not floor. Okay. If you're going to have a just a flat floor, mm -hmm. just use a plane. Don't grab uh, this object that says floor. Object in the object. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this whole window down here is the attributes window, right? And so everything about the object can be adjusted down here. The but it's separated into these tabs. Not all, not everything will have the same number of tabs or the same tabs, right? So the floor, you'll notice, has no object tab because there's nothing to, to, to adjust there. Uh, a plane will have an object tab that allows you to adjust the stuff about the plane. So yeah, the number, these tabs here are uh, particular to the specific object and different objects are different things. Like some, some of them have like 20 tabs, like the hair object is super complicated and it has like all these tabs and all this stuff. Um, and so this, this changes depending on what, uh, what the object is. Yeah, in the material, yeah. It may seem lame that it's not also in that instance, but that's another deal where um, by separating that out, it allows it to be scaled in a much, much, much uh, greater way. You know, now, 
we're not going to do this for a while, but you can have multiple materials per object, and you would want those materials to have different settings. So that's why all of that stuff is is done per material rather than per object. Right, if you had like a wall that was brick and Yeah, yeah, if you put it on if you put it on the floor, I don't think it's going to adjust the the UVs because the floor doesn't really have UV coordinates. Yeah, I wish this wasn't like the default thing that gets uh, made when you click this button, but yeah, I, I think that's different in 25. I don't think that's the default. Anyways. And we see that it doesn't, um, you know, the glass doesn't uh, refract or anything by, the viewport render won't do that either, because that's a very complicated uh, calculation to make. So why am I telling you to use the viewport render? That's correct. Who cares? Yes, yes, faster. So so much faster that it's practically real time. Yeah. Meaning that as you make changes, you see them reflected in real time, right? Which is better than for um Comparison here. I switch to the standard renderer. And here, watch to see what's happening here. You, you, you can take your time looking up actually. So this is the standard renderer. So this is on the CPU. See these boxes here? Each one of these is one of the cores on my CPU. And it's going through and it's drawing each tiny chunk of each of these uh, chunks, each of these squares is called a bucket. It's drawing each of these buckets. And um, you see that it's slowly working its way through this image. Now, if you pay attention particularly to the reflection, you'll see that as it fills in here, it is, the reflection information is different than what's going on in the viewport render. And that's like I told you, the reflections we're getting with the viewport render are not quote unquote real reflections. They are faked. However, what we're doing in this class is learning how to animate, not how to wait for real time reflections, right? Um, you can, once you get to that part, if you, that becomes a problem for you at that part of your career, you can buy your way out of that problem, right? As far as like using a render farm or a bunch of other solutions. Um, and if you look at this image, like as it's slowly filling it in here, like, yeah, this is uh, unobjectively sort of a, a higher fidelity image, right? But the, is especially in terms of the reflections here. But why, part of the reason it's so noticeable is because I put a glass thing in there, right? Without the glass thing, it would be way more uh, close. But the reason we're using the viewport render is so that we can get you know, real-time feedback and work at some sort of reasonable speed and focus on what we're actually making versus then waiting for renders. Because, like I said, this definitely looks like a higher fidelity image. However, the time trade-off here, as I've been rambling on and on and on, we haven't even got one frame. Whereas before, in the time it would take me to talk, it rendered the entire project using the viewport renderer, right? So it's not that it would take a little bit more time. It would take way more time, right? Because by the time this is done here, we're going to have one frame. And it's going to take, I don't know, four minutes. 
And so you can do that math on the back of a napkin. Four times 96 frames, it's going to take you, you know, all day to spit out that movie. And then you're going to turn it into me, and I'm going to say, cool, that was a good start. Let's change a bunch of stuff. And then you're going to have to go back and redo it. So this, this is why we're using the viewport renderer. So we can focus on doing the work and not waiting for all the stuff. Because the, the fidelity trade-off is much smaller than the time trade-off. Everything's a trade-off. Does that make sense? Right, it's still going. <laughs> and this, the speed that these buckets fill in is, again, a function of the whole system. So the settings in the system, how many lights you have, what kind of shadows those lights are casting, all this kind of stuff. And there's things you can do to speed this up or slow it down. But this is not how I want you to be spending your time. I want you to be doing some work versus waiting for a bunch of stuff to be spit out. Does this make sense now? Right, because here we do get refraction. See how the ball appears to like change shape because it's being bent by the glass. This is the weird thing. If you put a glass, <clears throat> usually this is uh, when you're trying to do glass stuff, students put glass on there. But um, in the real world, if we had a glass sphere like this, it's almost certainly an empty sphere, right? It's not like a solid piece of glass. Um, and, but by default, that's how it's rendering it, as if this is like a completely solid uh, piece of glass, which makes the refraction um, uh, way more, it's, it's much more refracted than uh, as if it were a thin um, wall of glass. And you could model it that way and make those changes, so on and so forth. Anyways, it's not the thing to focus on here. Does this, does this help clear up some, some stuff? Looking back at trying to render, and it's, it is set. Render, it's not. That's what I was watching. Yeah, yeah. So dark thing just bail over it, even if I have it set to viewport render, which uh, even to do this, control R still sends it to standard. Oh, it yeah, yeah, it's, but the, because now you're seeing what you're gonna get. Like this is, this is the, gonna be the output, right? And because I'm rendering to the viewport. They should probably, yeah, if you switch that, they should probably disable that thing, but they don't. So um, yeah, this is what you're gonna get. Even though if you press control R, it's still gonna take forever to spit out this image. Um, cause you, but because I have it set to this, I'm, you know, I'm not even going to get that image. I'm going to get this image, the viewport image. Cool. Was this was this enlightening? Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, because the viewport stuff is fairly new. Last four or five years or so that it looks this good. So usually there is no option to even have it look this good. So the fact uh, get to this point is uh, great. Now, uh, this makes it really, once you have it looking nice, then the stuff you bring in from the content browser should also, for the most part, look uh, fairly nice, like a wine bottle or something. When I bring things in objects from the content browser, you one of the issues is that the content browser is designed, the asset browser, used to be called the content browser, is designed to be um, to scale. So if I bring in a wine bottle and I bring in a car, they should be relatively to scale. Yeah. 
So here's a car, there's a wine bottle, you know, that looks... Before I was just making stuff up with this ball and background and stuff, which is why I wasn't really paying attention to like, what's the actual scale of this? I was just sort of making a scene. And now when I put this stuff in, you see that the scene, it's the scale of the scene, you know, now uh, matters. Part of the reason I'm explaining this and working on all of this is this week's stuff. This is a fun project. This was new last semester. And I thought it was a hit. Um, so this is part of, you know, the, we're able to access a bunch of these objects now and function like a director, right? As far as, you know, you're making a movie, you've got, uh, you're, you're an image maker, you're able to bring in all these things and sort of construct your own reality out of, out of a lot of things. Um, the stuff that's available easily is the stuff that's in the asset browser right now. But the way this is going is that what, you know, in the future, what kind of stuff is going to be available over here? You know, everything. Uh, later this semester we made, because the, there's apps on your phone now where you can scan like real world stuff and instead of like, you know, like you would in Photoshop, like if I need to do something with this microphone and take a picture, bring in the Photoshop, cut out the microphone, put, you know, do all my Photoshop magic to it. We're getting to that point in 3D now where it's like I can just scan this microphone and bring it in over here. We're going to limit ourselves to just this stuff in the asset browser for right now. But you, we can use all of this stuff and bring it in over here to uh, create images. And so that's what uh, the main project for this week is going to be. Uh, sort of ex uh, examining the idea of, you know, real realism and surrealism. Right, so the, uh, I have two really great, um, I can't remember, what is her name? Uh, the art assignment. Um, it's the same woman. I'll link to all of her information here. This is a, a really great channel that examines just all sorts of isms and issues in contemporary art making and culture. Super great. Um, anyways, um, two of the isms here that I've linked to are realism and surrealism. And I want you to watch both those. And we're going to use the asset browser to create worlds. We can create a realistic one and a surrealistic one. I've, um, and we're going to render both with the viewport <laughs> renderer so that it doesn't take a whole bunch of time in order to render this stuff out. Right, we're able to play with all these parts and uh, then get quick feedback. So uh, my introduction to the asset browser, which essentially I just did here, I'll switch some of these out probably. Um, and we'll look at some more tools in Cinema 4D for manifesting surrealism. We're just, you know, getting weird as opposed to realistic. But we're going to make two scenes here. Right, some sort of like realistic scene. In this case, I did, you know, office, typical. And then, you know, I did this one, which was surreal. And that, uh, you know, some of the objects reference realistic objects, but the way they're arranged and the general positioning and combination of them is real. Um, no, we're going to add a little bit of motion to them. So let's talk about that on. Wednesday, and I'll re-upload them and stuff. But both of these files I've provided here as 
Um, these are not templates. These are just you know my examples. You can download. You know, we can you can open them up and check out the stuff that I did here because I did a few other things. Some other stuff that we'll talk about on Wednesday. Um, as far as constructing these things, but if you wanted to get started, I would watch these two first to really cement your understanding of realism and surrealism, and then we'll sort of talk about that. Uh, from there with these with these specific examples. All right, these are zip files again, because why are they zip files? Why didn't I just give you a C40 file? All right, exactly, exactly, right? Because if you look, there's like, well, there's a bunch of junk in the scene, right? If I don't bring all that stuff along, it's going to look black. You just open it up if you just get the C40 file. Hence the, hence the zipping everything up. Yeah, yeah, it has the C, it has the C4D file plus the text folder. So if we look, if we unzip it, here's the folder. So it's got the C4D file, and then it's got text folder, right? The, remember, what I would memorize is that in AE, all the extra stuff goes into footage. In C4D, all the extra stuff goes into text. So I look in here, the whole bunch of uh, textures that got applied to a lot of the stuff that I used in this project, right? And so when I Project. Why is this taking a long time? It's not a long time, given the history of the universe. What's the? Why is it taking a while to appear? A lot of stuff, and it's got to, because it's all set up to look good, it's got to send all of this data over to the GPU, right? It's got to transfer it. Each thing has its own memory. CPU has its own memory. The GPU has its own memory. And it's got to send all those bits over to the GPU memory so that this can be fast. And then I can this off. And then I, fast enough, I should be able to look around. It's rendering, it's rendering, but it does wire frames in your central. But the the meshes? Yeah, the meshes. The, I thought, I thought you said the, the meshes the meshes are for the most part they're in the C4D file, right? It's the textures that are the external part. So the the polygons and their placement and stuff, that does get saved in C4D without you explicitly saying that for the most part. So, is that what you mean? What do you mean? That I'm just turning that off for the render, right? So, right, I, I want that stuff on in the program so that I can, you know, do work. Um, I want it off when I render so that it looks good. You don't want to have these showing up in your image under most circumstances. That's all the geometry, that's all this is doing. It's just saying, like, don't show me that stuff in the final output. The rest of the final output will be the same. Right, so I did, you know, there's a bunch of other objects here. I'd use some cloner. We'll talk about that on Wednesday as a way to sort of easily repeat things. But, you know, this is the surreal image that you can open up and check out as, a, as an example. And uh, there's a realistic one. So this is what we're going to be doing, making two of these. So we'll talk about setting this stuff up and, and animating it on 
Sound good? Yes. When there's just four of us, you can really just start talking, Sophia. It's cool. <laughs> Yep. So the, the black lines are the the polygons, right? So when you're dealing with the 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 relationship between the polygons and the shape, it's called topology. It's a word I would I would memorize, right? So this is the layout of polygons on the surface. Right. And our two things here, N, B, this is uh, show polygons, and N, A, turn off. And so in this case, I can tell with the sphere that it looks a little funky. And so if I hit N, B, I can see, the, oh, okay, that, that's clearer now. So the segments can turn that up. Now, the there is a point of diminishing returns here, right? How, how high do I need to crank this up? It depends on how big this sphere is in the frame, okay? If I'm get, gonna zoom in very, very, very close to the sphere sometime during the shot, then I might need to have a bunch of polygons, right? If, if it's just gonna be this size in the frame, like right about there, that looks sufficiently round to my eyes right now. If I sort of look at it, yeah, that looks good. Um, and so you want to adjust when it's when it, it's not always just one number. Okay, so sometimes it's more complicated than that. For instance, if I make a I make a cube, and this is the rounding box. Turn this on. I have separate um, controls for the subdivisions on the surface of the cube versus the subdivisions of the part where the rounding is. Okay, so we'll, t we'll explore this more, but you see there's different controls for different parts of the object. Does that make sense? The, so the, that, the, that's a shortcut you definitely want to memorize, N, B, N, A, because we obviously need to see the polygons to make this call here about how smooth it needs to be. But especially with high polygon count objects, like if this were some sort of super detailed thing, you can see that having that many polygons in the view all the time would make it tough to A, see what color it is, maybe. Right, if you have something that's really, really high polygon count and you zoom far enough away from it and you have that turned on, like you can't even see whatever color it is. It's just black because it's all, Polygon lines, right? If I zoom in, you can see it. Yeah, the, just and uh, no, those those are the shortcuts for yeah for for the view setting, like whether I'm looking at polygons or not. If you look, I think it's up under display. They're all listed here, right? And so garrode shading with lines is NB. That means it's going to show us the polygons. And then NA is just the shading without the lines. There's all sorts of other views here, but those are the ones that are the ones that we use most often here. So under display, NA, NB. So you, if you don't want to hit the buttons, you can come up here and switch them that way. Is that clear? Any more questions about that? Yes. Yeah, that, that's uh, called Studio Backdrop. So you just type Studio, it should come up. This is this one right here.
I mean, you probably brought in something from the asset browser and then didn't uh, save project with assets, maybe moved it to a different location, and then it didn't know where the assets were. Right? Because if you just make it, it'll. It's, the assets that came version without. Yeah, 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 right? And so at this point, right, um, it's important to think about all of our stuff as like projects contained in a folder. So when you, if you need to move the project or save it somewhere else, you need to copy the entire folder and bring everything along for the ride. You can't just save a C4D file and then move it. If you need to change the, the where you're saving stuff, you need to move the entire folder. I would take this whole folder, copy it over to my documents. That would ensure that everything comes along versus uh, just copying the C40 file. Logan, any questions from you? I think you might be the only person on the stream. Is that true? Oh, no, for, for uh, a couple nanoseconds, like somebody else was watching. I can't see who's watching. I can just see, see this. Look, right around there, we had a blip where two people tuned in and then just uh, opted out. Or it might be network interference, who knows? Sure. I mean, we'll talk about this both more on Wednesday, but let me download it. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about both of them more on Wednesday, but uh, grab it. What happened to my Windows now? No, no, that's a separate process. In order, you know, like, that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. I, I, I unzipped it, is what yeah, I just yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, you don't save it as a zip file. You, you do the save with assets. Okay. You, to zip something, that's a file browser. Um, I just wonder why you say. Well, because that gives you one thing to download as opposed to. When you send people stuff on the internet, you don't want to send them a, a folder of stuff, right? It just chunks it down into one. You know, it takes a whole a whole bunch of files and smushes them into one yeah, thing. Yeah. Right, right, right. Like, because like I just said, if you're moving stuff around on your computer, you move the whole folder, right? If you're sending it to someone else, right. you're gonna want to zip before you give it to them, unless you're giving them like a drive or something. I mean, like, if you're sending it over the internet, this is the better way to do it, okay. right? Uh, so yeah, here's the... I get tons of zip. Yeah, I mean, not, not only is it, it just gives you one thing to download. There's also an issue of, um, it, it'll be less, uh, zipping not only 
packages it up into one thing. There's also um, data compression. Yeah. So it makes it, the size of the zip file is most of the time less than the size of all the stuff added up because it's cheating and saving data using a variety of things. So, so they're both of those things. Now, how much smaller is a whole thing? You know, as far as like, there's different ways to do it, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so this, this one, I just tried to make something that looked uh, real, real, realistic, right? Now, I made a, a office-ish kind of thing. You know, we do this on Wednesday, this month, I, but I mean, and so if you look through the, um, if you just want to look through the objects, um, you know, there's different categories of stuff here. You, you see it would be easier to make some spaces rather than others, as far as like the kind of things that are available here. But this idea, right, we're making something that's realistic, something that's surreal, using, you know, a whole library of things. So, you know, I would think of this in my mind as more of like a postmodern, um, like collage exercise, right? Where instead of collaging like stuff you cut out of a magazine, you're reconstructing a world here with three-dimensional things. You can do it to make something that looks typical or something that doesn't look typical at all. There's all sorts of other stuff down here. Oh, so the stuff that I used is all, you know, here. Yeah, right? so, yeah so again, this, uh, I didn't directly manage a lot of this, and some of them are probably duplicated. Yeah. So I, I don't think, uh, yeah, like the, like the chair, if I were to select the chair, you'll see that um, if you drill down on the chair over here, th there's different parts, and the parts have different materials. And so when I bring that chair in from the asset browser, it also brings in all of these materials. So all of those come in. Some of those materials may have been reused in a briefcase or something. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I'm not going in and adjusting a bunch of that stuff. Um, so it's important to realize the complexity of some of the things coming in from the asset browser may be very different, right? Some of them are just like, like a bench or something, right? But this chair has different parts. Part of the reason it has separate parts is that allows you to adjust the materials independently. It also allows you to adjust the object independently, right? So eight here, detach that or rotate it or something. If I select the top level of it, you know, this doesn't really have any controls like some of the other ones. I don't know if any of these objects really do. The studio backdrop does. Case, cover parts. We'll get into more of this. But I mean, these, these are all things I just brought in from the. So on Wednesday, I'll sort of start from scratch and you know build some things, talk about some other functions here. But as far as between now and Wednesday, I, I would do what we did the first part of class, like take a blank scene and set it up for the viewport render as an exercise in like understanding how that works. Because we're going to use the viewport render so that it's easy to render these things. Fast, much faster. The good news is, is that we're rapidly approaching a world where this will become irrelevant. Right? Obviously, it would be better if, as soon as I added anything, it immediately showed me exactly what it looked like as realistically as possible, right? And yeah, we're getting closer and closer to that. I mean, it's here in some instances, depending on how nice your computer is, right? But uh, yeah. This is that uh, the future's here, it's just unequally distributed. So 
we're kind of in the middle. Sound good? So for Wednesday, you know, do do a viewport set up here. You guys can work on that for a second, and then uh, on Wednesday, I mean, we're not going to turn it in or anything, just as an exercise. But then on Wednesday, I'll step through more specifics with the homework and some other stuff that I did in the examples. I'll go through and explain it. No, don't. Do, yeah, you don't. Don't make my scenes. Yeah. You just need to make one that's realistic and one that's surreal. I'll see if I can find some more student examples from last semester. So people made some pretty cool stuff. For Wednesday. Yeah, look at right, right. Yeah, th this is going to be due. The project itself is going to be due a week from Wednesday because we're off on uh, Monday. Everybody, everybody have that down their calendars? Monday is uh, President's Day. So spend the day celebrating your favorite president. Whoever that might be. <laughs> well, I think we can maybe all. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Link Lincoln's birthday. You could even celebrate like all the ones who are still alive. Even who's alive. Still. Last two, Jimmy Carter's still alive, Obama's still alive, Clinton's still alive, Bush. That's it. I think just those six. 